Hello again. Uh, let's try this one more time. Hopefully you can hear us, although frankly, who wants to look at me uh, in my kitchen? But welcome to Auto Express. Lunchtime lockdown. Apologies for that, but he's trying to challenge. Uh, as, uh, as somebody's just said, uh, having a technical problem is better than a wardrobe malfunction. On trousers, long trousers, I should point out, not just trousers, uh, for well over a month. Uh, over Sean Carson, Sean. Uh, yep, sorry about the, the technology. Do let us know if you're experiencing any. And he's driven the car in Namibia. I've driven it in the UK, Sean. Well, we were on was three days. Um, and along dusty gravel tracks. So everything. Probably. That's pretty impressive. Um, I haven't experienced it off-road, uh, but in my drive I had uh, around the uh, the Midlands, around Jaguar Land Rover's HQ in Gaden, I think it took me about 200 yards to realise the car was uh, was going to be quite special um, and quite different from the Defender. So, uh, you know, I really quite surprised how playful the car was. Um, it wasn't there was a moment where uh, Mike Cross, who's quite a driver himself, who's uh, Jaguar Land Rover's chief uh, uh, test driver and the engineering team runs those guys. Uh, he was taking me around their test track at, uh, at a three-figure speed uh, around a, a bend. Which is, is say, I really wasn't expecting. There was no body lean, no squeal of the tires. When I was driving myself, he kind of could... Lift out, lift off a little bit, and get the nose tucking in. Not quite like a how much fun the car was to drive, which is something you can't really say about Discovery. Um, but in Namibia, sure. Well, I think that's a that's a really good point, Steve, about the um, the sense of fun you get from the car. Jaguar Land Rover's big engineering boss, Nick Rogers, joined us out there on the trip, and that was something that he was trying to get across that they wanted to instill this character that that separated the defender kind of like you can actually it's quite nice and you feel that it's got good agility for an su its size and weight that rides that high from the road how good it Everything is usually about power, naught to 60 times. But, but the Defender does something different. Um, all the technology that Land Rover's crammed into the car to make it so capable off-road puts you front and centre of the driving experience and direct the car and low speeds and have fun to do road settings but the thing i like is you just put it in one set extremes of namibia as well yeah definitely and for experience uh, guides out with us who were talking us through the tech on food and raise the air even those very experienced at this kind of thing admitted that pretty much for most of the time it adjusts all the different parameters diffs the esc the hill descent you can get really involved in the such as clear sight ground view that 
I'm going to use a, a, a neat sentence. Uh, um, I must just admit, when I first saw the, the defender uh, and that moment where they pull the cover off and you're all supposed to get fantastic thinking. Really retro, something a bit more. Uh, but the thing that the say is if of course, it was some lovely but the interior. That since you can have three car, um, in spite of what it looks, does it? I have so the interior of the defender. You've got six seats. You can't have eight seats, so you can't have the middle seat in the front of the car and the two at the back, which I thought was a bit of a shame. But there were plenty of other lovely interior features, aren't there? Yeah, I think there are lots of. Utilitarian feel that the old defender was known for. Um, fear that little bit as well. And I think that's a point that the the this new car um, really a bit more of that pre. I would think so for the price. Uh, let's be honest, um, this isn't the total length. It's an expensive car, not the the old farmer's friend that it used to be. Uh, prices start for the 110 at four. Start 90 we can't just yet uh, is £40,000. So this is an expensive car. Um, the other issue as well um, is one that, that Peter on that you for the top have Land Rover, my friends, they are very, really good point because I run a few Land Rovers. They are many of them the best cars in the world, but you always have to say, mm, but they might go wrong. Um, and unfortunately, the the, the power server press has published. You can see the results online now. It doesn't do well, does it? But this is built to make a difference. I hope that it, it will make a difference. And one thing that I know uh, Landover has spent an awful lot of time and is. Companies invest in new electronic architecture and also the, the testing process to develop that you would hope a Land Rover is going to give you. And one thing that that also um, I think pretty rubbish. Really yeah, I think that's fair to say. And and you guys out there, you know, our read be this as uh, in the current Land Rover model, uh, Apple uh, CarPlay. And Android Auto, it is improved even on the beta version we tested. There were crashes and bugs that we um, encountered. Very hard for it. I think uh, the new plant. The question is you and said, Should I buy a new Land Rover Defender? 
fine now. I guess. Uh, feedback and feedback to London. A while, so I guess the default will not let you down. But what I could say um, categorically is that it is a it's a car with great in that land toes they they overlap that little bit but the defender feels decidedly different yeah i think again you can out the three lead as well but it's 79 hours so between 40,000 and 80,000, you can get Defender, every sport, Evoke, gets into there as well. Um, Valar, the car? Valar, yeah, yeah the yeah. Valar, bottom Range Rover, um, easy, easy one to forget, does look nice. Uh, seven, so they, seven, the right fingers. So there, there are a lot of Range Rovers uh, that kind of overlap in a, in a Venn diagram type form. And, and so... Let, let's let's before we move on to other stuff, Sean. Let's let's just ask you which Land Rover product would you have between that forty and uh, an eighty? Would you have a Defender? Do you know what? I think I would have a Defender, and it goes back to that point that um, it feels it feels different. It's got its own identity, and I quite like that in a car. I think that um, one, the styling is good. I yeah. quite like the I quite like the look of the car. The look of the car. I didn't necessarily. I, I almost didn't know quite how I felt about it when I first saw it on the motor show stand, but I've certainly warmed to the way it looks. And I think when I saw it out in Namibia, amongst the in the location uh, where it's been designed and engineered to perform, it, it definitely looked the part. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I must admit, I've I've kind of fallen in love with the car, the way it drives. Um, I guess the problem for me is I just love the Range Rover so much, um, and uh, in fact, we've got to or wait 12 to fix any bugs. I think you'll struggle to get one of the early cars, which might not be a bad thing because there'll be a, a waiting list. Um, but, but yeah, I think I'd be sorely tempted by a Defender and, and just hope that um, that these reliability things, and, and we know that they've changed the whole engineering, uh, the way the engineering is is done and the t way the teams work together to try and make sure that this is a, a Land Rover that will last. And I guess it has to, doesn't it, really? Definitely, Steve. And I think to to help answer Tyrone's question, um, one thing that Land Rover is rolling out with the new Defender is over-the-air software updates for the car, which will yep. come online yep. at some point in the future. So while, yes, maybe later cars will have a few fixes for bugs that might have been fed back or picked up, that doesn't necessarily mean to say that early cars won't be able to be updated remotely to sort of smooth out that... Um, that ownership kind of prospect. So I think that um, we hope, because there's lots of things good with the car, there's lots right with the car, but we hope that the reliability and the, and the customer experience lives up to everything else, uh, everything else that the car offers. Yeah, uh, in fact, somebody's just said, uh, is it uh, just me finding the clothes being hung behind Steve odd, calm and fascinating? Well, that's my, uh, my wife wearing a very embarrassing top and hotspur top putting the washing out because i think she thought we'd be finished by now but there we go uh so uh, apologies if you are finding my wife's washing uh rather that sounds awful to me, my wife hanging her washing oddly calming um but uh i'm more embarrassed by the top and hotspur top talking about um top and hotspur as a top and hotspur fan phil mullins who was on twitter earlier we were going to talk about lockdown hair he's got awesome lockdown hair. he's just had the whole thing shaved off anyway uh so alex is asking is there any point in the discovery anymore if the defender is so good i think they've got different places haven't they sure yeah i think they have i think when land rover launched the discovery five a few years ago um they definitely pushed it up market and it was more premium. And the price rose because of that as well. It was, it was basically, it felt like a seven-seat Range Rover. And now Defenders arrived, it, that kind of makes sense. We know 
but they've tried they've spread the two cars apart so um i think there is a still a point in the discovery if if the defender exists because the discovery is definitely is a uh, a little bit more upmarket more luxurious uh, slightly different image because you know the styling is divisive on that there's there's no two ways about it but um it does offer you something different uh, you know if you want to spend your 55 60 65 thousand pounds um on a big suv with lots of seats there there are two ways to go about it now okay let's let's take the the final couple of questions on the discovery before we move on to uh, to something else briefly uh, tyrone's asking will there be cylinder diesel and uh, on uh, twitter earlier will was asking why why they, haven't they just done an all-electric one where's the where's the all-electric story for defender well there, there will be a that in fact, there already is an electrified Defender um, on sale. The P400 is a mild hybrid, but there will be a, a plug-in hybrid that will join the range uh, later on. So there is going to be some electrification. Uh, as for a full-on EV, not so sure about that just yet. Um, we can but hope. Um, as for a six-cylinder uh, Defender, we already know that Land Rover has a lot in the pipeline for this for this body style um for this model that they'll go on, be go on go on what is it what is it go on tell us tell oh, us what well, is it well no, there's, there's nothing confirmed but if you look what um if you look what land rover has done with its other nameplates with discovery it's it's got a family of cars with range rover range rover sport discovery discovery sport and we know that the previous defender obviously had commercial um applications available so we know land rover uh, are looking at, at different options and and potentially you know there might be a an svo inspired or breathed on version in the future yes. um so watch the space i think is the answer to that one now you're talking now i, I was lucky enough to run a, a g63 for a while uh, g class and you know with a burbling v8 that made a hell of a noise that was just a spectacular car and i think a v8 version uh, an svo version of the uh, uh, the, uh, the the new defender will be absolutely fantastic. I can't wait for that. But you're right. Th there is the, the mild hybrid system in the P400, um, which actually worked pretty well. I thought, although you can't run electrification, uh, I'm told that plug-in hybrids uh, are coming in on the subject of plug-in hybrids tomorrow in tomorrow's Auto Express. You can see first news of another couple of uh, Land Rover plug-in hybrid models, the Discovery Sport and the Range Rover Evoque. Uh, can't say anything more because it's all embargo until tomorrow. Probably broken the embargo by even mentioning it, but look at Auto Express tomorrow. So um, some news that has come out today. Let's move away from from the uh, the lovely Land Rover Defender uh, and talk about the new Audi A3 Saloon, which has been unveiled today. And um, I guess uh, I'm going to be blunt. What's the point? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. Certainly, over here in the UK, we're big fans of hatchbacks. So. The A3 Sportback is going to make up the majority of sales. But I quite like the fact that Audi have persevered with the saloon body style because it, it just offers something that little bit different. Um, I quite like the look of the car. I think, you know, you go back and look through the back catalogue of A3s and they're always quite reserved products. But they're, I think the saloon is a, a well-proportioned um, vehicle. And there's, I think there's one more point to make on that as well, that if you look at the pre previous gen a3 cabriolet that car was actually based on the saloon so to have a more elegant a3 cabriolet of this um new generation of a3 i think that the saloon exists is uh, or saloon will exist is definitely a good thing well you know for for sure it's going to have a fantastic interior it's going to have the uh, mmi system it's going to have a digital dash i think matrix headlights will be uh, uh, be available engine wise i understand two 1.5 tfsi uh, units um, one two liter tdi uh, who knows which is which because they've all got that weird um, nomenclature now so a 35 tfsi is a 1.5 liter engine i'm sure there's a way of working it out but the thing that gets me about this car it's uh, as i understand it's about 4.5 meters long um, the audi a4 is 4.7 meters long now that's what and I guess that it's well a, a, a ruler. I remember, my ruler at school is a foot long, thirty centimeters. So we're talking about Defender overlapping with other models in the Land Rover range. Do we really need a four-door Audi A3? Do we need 
and I know there is a Mercedes A-Class saloon as well as the Mercedes LA, which is a saloon. Uh, there's the big, do, do, we, do we need so many different versions of all these cars? Um, I guess that from your view, if Audi and is believe a business case for them, then and they must do because they're on sale, then I think consumers having a wide range of choice is actually a good thing. You know, if you want your hatchback, if you want your A3 in hatchback form, then you buy the hatchback. If you want it as a saloon, you, know, you buy the saloon. I think um, if you look at other uh, niches, you know, we have, we've got q3 and q3 sportback and and kind of coupe forms of suv body styles so i think it's just a good thing that that the choice is there available you know in some cases you pay a premium for it but um it makes the makes the road an interesting place to car spot yeah felipe has said on uh, on youtube i don't understand this compact sedan format reminds me of the 80s corsa sedan I don't understand it either. I'm I, I'm not a massive sedan saloon fan, if I'm perfectly honest. That is so clever. The technology should make money on. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I, personally, I don't understand it. Uh, Pete Baden has said, "I love the look of the new A3's interior." How do you think it compares to the A Class and One Series? Now, A Class, oh, what an interior! Yeah, yeah the A the A Class's cabin is um, is really nice, and I think the fact that that came out a few years ago, and next to the new One Series that was only released last year, um, that that shows that Mercedes really got it right. The quality materials. There's nothing wrong with the One Series cabin. All of, in fact, the infotainment works brilliantly and ergonomically it's quite good, but it just it just lacks a little bit of sparkle compared to the Mercedes for me. Yeah, I think uh, Audi's cabins are renowned for being beautifully built, but I, I just think you're right. There's a bit of sparkle to the uh, to the Mercedes cabin. That said, um, and we'll we'll move on to the, the next subject. Now we're going to talk about PHEVs. I recently, before lockdown, had a Mercedes A Class A250 which is the, the plug was fantastic we'll talk about that in a minute but the car rattled it's an a-class now you know it's got quality you get in now you, you, the chances are that somebody comes up and uh, uh, and says i've got a like mother girl. you don't poor Mercedes need to address. That's interesting. Um, I was in a CLA 35 uh, not long before, an AMG version, not long before lockdown. And I thought that the the quality in that was quite good. And given the fact that that one was on 19-inch wheels because it had the premium plus pack, so adaptive dampers as well, um, but it was quite good. So I don't know whether it was um, just a Friday afternoon Yeah, we, we were also running. Let, let's talk about plug-in hybrids now, which is, um, as I said, there's news about plug-in hybrids and Auto Express uh, out tomorrow on Wednesday. Uh, and it seems that no car is launched without a plug-in hybrid system. I wouldn't be surprised to see the A3 eventually with a, an e-tron plug-in hybrid system as well. Um, but plug-in hybrids, some people have said they're the, 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 an ideal stepping stone towards full electric. Other people have said it's the worst of both worlds being the fact that you're going to have to lug around some batteries when they're when they're dead, and you've got an inefficient petrol engine doing the same, you know, pulling those those batteries around, it, it just doesn't make sense. But what's your view on plug-in hybrids, Sean? Well, I think it's a kind of horses for courses debate, really, because it all comes down to how you use your car. So, for example, if your commute is, um, you know, maybe 20 miles or so, or your round trip is only 25, 30 miles a day, the school runs, the supermarket or the gym, I think that a plug-in hybrid can be um, could be a very good option for you. What we can't stress enough at Auto Express is that if you do have a plug-in hybrid, you must charge it religiously at night to, to maximise the efficiency potential. Otherwise, like you say, Steve, 
you, you're driving around the car with an electric motor and a big battery pack with a, a 1.4 petrol engine, let's say, uh, carrying all that dead weight and it's not contributing anything. Um, the other thing about plug-in hybrids is if, if you're going to need that kind of long distance uh, touring or cruising ability, uh, then they're really good because obviously, you know, when you deplete the battery, um, your petrol or diesel engine kicks in and you don't have to worry about, you know, range anxiety is not a problem for you. Um, so it depends how you look at them, how you view the debate, uh, whether you think a plug-in hybrid is, is a good idea or not. I think we're seeing uh, a lot better uh, in terms of range for plug-in hybrids. The, the Mercedes A250e that I had, uh, I think the range is around 45 miles, the claimed range. And, and you know what? I was driving it around. Uh, I had to force it to, to uh, for the internal combustion engine to, to kick in. Otherwise, I've just been driving around, including the uh, stint on the motorway, on fully electric power. It's, it's a really nice experience, obviously, driving fully electric. But I genuinely uh, managed to get over 40 miles of range out of the uh, out of the car, uh, which I think is is pretty good these days. Certainly better than the the first experience. And 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 let's be honest, as you're saying, for most people, most of the time, twenty miles or around twenty miles, it's all they do a day. Um, so if the, as long as they plug in, and the clue is in the name, as you quite rightly said, it's a plug in hybrid. You've got to plug in. Um, there are tax benefits, of course, to uh, uh, to plug in hybrids with the low CO2 outputs, particularly if they do uh, a, a greater range. The MPG claims of 200 miles uh, per gallon plus, again, if you're plugging in all the time, that is actually achievable. The clue is in the name. Now, I know a lot of people have bought um, the, the UK's best-selling plug-in hybrid, I think, is the Mitsubishi Outlander. Uh, and a lot of people bought those. It's one of the first on the market. Again, if you plug it in, super efficient. A lot of people bought it for the tax incentives, never plugged them in. And the companies that, that bought the cars as company cars have found they've had huge fuel bills for people driving a, a car with a, an inefficient petrol engine going lots of miles, lugging a load of batteries around. So you've got to use these cars properly. Difficult thing to, to police if you're looking at the taxation issue. Uh, but in my view, they are a good stepping stone towards electrification, which is where we're all going to end up, whether we like it or not. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And um on your point, Steve, about the improving range of this sort of uh, new crop of plug-in hybrids we're seeing coming through, that's reflected in the government's taxation of these cars. So if you look at the company car tax bandings now, that um, cars with zero emission uh, capability, they're banded on how far they can travel uh, yeah. on electric power alone. So the government's cottoning on to this fact as well. I think one thing about plugging them in is, it can be, I wouldn't say it can, it can be a chore because it's, it's, it's so simple, you know, when you get home to just, if you've got a, a home wall box to just uh, plug it in and schedule your charging if it's got that capability. But if you equate that to a running cost advantage, if you work out just how cheap it is to run that car on electricity for those 20 or 30 miles, and then do that over the find out Ford as well with plug-in hybrid version of the new Cougar. It's it's coming to to so many cars. It is, and I think um, <laughs> excuse me. The the point about the stepping stone to full electrification is a good one because I've I've got friends and family who've sampled plug-in hybrid cars and and once they've tried that um, that powertrain and experienced that hit of electrified torque that kind of smoothly and serenely propels you up the road they're more interested to see what a full electric car might be like and the benefits that it'll bring again for running costs but for refinement and for port for performance because if you look at a kia e-nero for example 201 horsepower but it's got super super high torque so actually away from the lights it's as quick as a, a small hot <laughs> like the ford fiesta st so you've got performance there as well 
Yeah, I'm a big fan of the uh, the Kia Nero. The thing I love about that car, from an electric point of view, is it's it's real world range. You know, Kia claim around 250 miles. It will do 250 miles. I did a journey uh, with my family of five, some of whom have been wandering around uh, behind, and are still wandering around behind, even though we're no, we're broadcasting. I'll take it up with them later. Family of five to my parents, 75 miles there, 75 miles back, full charge to start with. I got home, I had 111 miles of range still left. That was on a motorway where these cars are supposed to be their least efficient. But yeah, I'm really impressed. I think if I was to name one brand that's really surprised me, it's probably leading in terms of electric technology, Tesla aside, um, I think I would say Kia or Hyundai as as a group are probably leading that. I think they probably are. You're right. With cars like the the Kia e Nero and the Soul, new Soul EV, that's a very good car. Um, and the, the, there's a model year 20 Kona Electric just come out. Um, but I think we're going to see some competition for the likes of Kia and Hyundai from Volkswagen and the Volkswagen Group once um, Volkswagen's family of ID cars are out there on sale. Yeah. Um, I think they're going to be impressive products. And as long as they can get their... Um, control electronics for the battery right and the thermal management because this is where all the where really you know the the range really lies in the nitty-gritty of the engineering details and let's face it if you're buying a an electric car or a plug-in car you want you want maximum electric range you can so i think volkswagen um will do pretty well with their id family of cars yeah yeah, I think you're right. Maybe I think electric cars is probably a, a whole new Auto Express lunchtime live uh, in the future, um, and maybe one that we can do again uh, when the technology gets right. But for now, I think, Sean, um, we should probably wrap up today's broadcast. Uh, I apologise again, ladies and gentlemen, that we've had um, some technical issues. We may still be having some sound issues. This is something we will get ironed out. The next one will be even better. So thank you very much for bearing with us. Um, of course, we want to hear what you've got to say uh, about this. Uh, email us um, at, uh, at our email address. It's in the magazine on the website. Uh, tweet us or, or make comments. Um, just get in touch with us. We've also got the Auto Express podcast, which is out on Wednesday morning, as is the magazine. Um, in the meantime, um, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Sean. It's been very good of you to, to join me today. Thanks very much, Steve. Thanks very much, everyone out there watching, and thanks for bearing with us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again very soon for another Auto Express lunchtime live. But for now, I'm going to go and add my lunch. Good to see you, and thanks a lot. Bye.